How's it going guys, I'm Josh, and today we're gonna to learn about storytelling with photography. Now, storytelling is one of the most important parts of being a well-rounded photographer. It'll help you get jobs shooting events like weddings, booking portrait gigs, puppy portraits, it's a great practice in documentary photography and photojournalism, and it's a crucial part of any sort of travel photography. Essentially, it separates the one-hit wonder photographers who might be able to put together a nice looking Instagram feed over time from those who can produce a high quality body of work with limited periods of time. Those are the people that you actually want to hire. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing what it means to tell a story with your work, followed by eight actionable tips on doing so, and finally, a fun challenge to get you guys out there shooting and telling your own stories. Before we jump in, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you'd like to build a portfolio, print shop, or niche website dedicated to the most underappreciated baked good, the scone, Squarespace has you covered. How do you tell a story with photographs? The first thing we want to do is understand the basic components of storytelling in all mediums. So the traditional story is going to have a subject, location, a conflict, and then themes or motives, also known as context. And of course, there are a bunch of abstract exceptions to this rule, but this is a really nice basic guideline. One of the best ways to tell stories with images is through a collection of images, also known as a photo set, story, series, or essay. And we can debate the slight differences between these collections all day, but the common element here is that they all have a narrative threading the images together. Just because photos are compiled together does not mean they're a complete story. So for example, your dad's family vacation photo albums, or it's just your whole family, in different locations looking the exact same with the same cheesy four smiles isn't really a great story to tell. Meanwhile, if you wanted to tell a full story about your vacation, you might want to have some photos of the sunrise coming up, some candids of the activities you guys were doing, pose group shots aren't a bad idea, some nighttime work, variety of times throughout the day. You just want to have a lot of diversity to tell a whole story about what you guys did when you were out there. Even though these might be the same vacations, having that diversity makes it a much more interesting story to follow and tells much more about the trip itself. Can an individual photo tell a story? Absolutely. Street photography can be a really great example of this because you tend to capture a whole scene of events happening. So Alex Webb, a famous Magnum photographer, captures photos from Mexico that in my opinion tell a very complete story that makes you ask questions, are complex in subject matter, and that inspire empathy all in one photo. And they also work really beautifully in a collection. Can an individual photo not tell a story and still be excellent? And the answer is absolutely. So for example, one of my favorite landscape photographers, Chris Burkhardt, has some very simple work that's absolutely powerful, but I would say these landscape photos don't really tell much of a story. Now meanwhile, when you introduce people into the shot, it adds a lot of context that I would argue makes it more of a complete story, but still, all of these photos are absolutely incredible and so powerful. The same goes for portraits. So depending on the location and the emotion you see in the subject, some portraits tell more of a story than others. Some of you guys might disagree with this statement because you can actually find stories in any single given photo. So for example, this simple landscape shot we could say tells a story about the environment and conservation, and that's part of the beautiful ambiguity of storytelling. Another storytelling device is pairing your photo or set of photos with text, which adds a whole other layer of context and dimensionality to your story. You also don't necessarily have to follow the basic structure of beginning, middle, and end in your photo story. Some photographers like to leave a lot of ambiguity and mystery in their work, which leaves more questions left unanswered, and there's something incredibly beautiful about that. A story can occur at the same place within five minutes, like Ansel Adams' famous five photo series known as Surf Sequence, or it can occur over a long period of time in a bunch of different locations, like an exploration of doorways across the world over the period of a decade, or even a century. As you can see, there are so many different ways you can tell a story, and there's never gonna be any right way to do it. However, being able to photograph an event or outing is a super valuable skill, great for getting photo gigs, and it's an awesome way to practice telling stories, since the narrative structure of a trip or a wedding or any sort of event is usually pretty clear and not too abstract. So let's go on with eight tips for photographing events and making photo sets. Number one, shoot the ugly. To tell a complete narrative, sometimes you're gonna come across incredibly unphotogenic moments that are extremely important to the storyline. So for example, it could be the big kissing scene at a wedding or just a really amazing street scene that you have suboptimal lighting, the wrong lens on, a boring background, etc. 
Now, what you have to remember here is that the most mediocre photo is so much better than not shooting the photo at all. So sometimes you would just have to shoot, shoot, shoot and compromise quality. For example, this street photo I shot of Harlem locals blasting a tour bus going through their neighborhood. Now the photo itself, background's not great, lighting is kind of meh, but the moment is wild and for that reason I love this photo. Number two, establishing shots. So establishing shots are really great ways to add context to your story. So if you're photographing a wedding, shoot a photo of the building that it's being held in. If you may or may not have just sneaking in to this abandoned building, maybe shoot a photo of the locked gate. These photos may or may not be sexy, but they add really important context to your story. One of the most important establishing shots is the first photo in your series. This is the introduction to what your photo series is going to say and talk about and needs to draw people's attention in. This is especially true in the days of Instagram where you might be posting your entire story as a carousel and you want the first photo to really suck people's attention, get them excited to keep swiping to look at the rest of the set. Number three, group shots. Now when you shoot any sort of wedding, event, or trip, you're gonna be shooting a lot of candidates of the main action. So shooting the ceremony, all of that stuff going down. Now what I recommend you do is you also take some of your members of the event aside for some simple portraits, both individually and as one big group. Now the reason why I really like doing this is because it's the most clean, simple answer to the question of who in your story and it's not quite the same as a candid shot of these people in action. And these simple photos provide a lot of context and become a clean memento or souvenir for the event. For example, whenever I go on a trip, I mostly shoot candid photos of my friends and landscapes, but I always make an effort to shoot one group shot because it's simple, eliminating all the activities and distractions, making for the most concentrated answer to the question of who. This simplicity of the group shot is awesome because it serves as a blank canvas, reflecting your own feelings about the event or trip and the people on it. It's also a great memory of having everyone together in one shot, including me, the photographer, who's usually not in any of the photos. Number four, pose versus candid photos. So it's really nice to have a mix of both pose and candid shots in any photo story, but you have to really understand when is a good time for each of these opportunities. So if everyone's super busy with whatever event or activity they're doing, then you're probably not gonna have the time to pull people aside and have them do five minute pose photo shoots. You'll also learn a lot from the first time you ask each person to step aside and do a portrait based on how enthusiastically they respond, how patient they are if they ask to see the photos. Basically just use your social intelligence to understand who's super down for it and wants to get a new profile pic and who could care less about the camera because you're always gonna run into both these types of people. Another way to get people more excited is showing them the photos you've taken so far because sometimes people don't trust the photographer but once they see you're getting awesome photos, they might become more enthusiastic. But really, read the scene, don't annoy people, and if you do need to photograph someone that's not crazy eager about it, only ask them when you know the shot's gonna be really good, rather than having them try four different poses that may or may not work out. Number five, time is of the essence. Get comfortable with your camera so you never miss a shot. When you're shooting any sort of event or candid photos, you wanna make sure your settings are awesome because you can't always ask your subjects to pose for 30 seconds while you adjust your camera settings. So consider using some of the semi-automated settings like shutter and aperture priority mode or manual mode with ISO auto. These are really worth for going the control because it's gonna help you shoot much faster and make sure your shots are properly exposed. If you're not comfortable with your camera's manual settings, consider taking a look at my Udemy course, a nine hour comprehensive beginner photography course that covers everything from using your camera, shooting, editing, and marketing your shots. You can take a look at it, link right here. I'm very proud of it and I think you'll enjoy it. Number six, story arc. So don't just shoot the main event, shoot everything leading up to it and everything afterward too because that's when some of the most exciting stuff happens. So for example, if I was gonna go shoot someone skating a big old handrail, I'd wanna shoot a photo of them nervously looking at it before they try it for the first time. I like shooting photos after they took a really hard slam and are just in pain and bloody. And then a celebration photo of once everyone's high five and the homies
homies after having rolled away. So this whole story, which could have just been one simple photo. One of my favorite after the main event photos is shot by my friend Josh Shero. His name's Flashing Lights on Instagram. And it's of Times Square after the ball is already dropped and people have cleared out. You've got so much confetti on the ground. And this photo, even though it would work really great with a bunch of Times Square celebration photos, also stands up on its own because it's like this nice mystery. You're wondering what happened before that led up to this and what's gonna happen afterward. If he wanted to turn this photo into a really cool photo set, what he could do is set the camera up on a tripod and shoot the exact same photo, one during the actual New Year's Eve celebration, two is the photo we just saw, and then the third one is once everything's been cleaned off the next day and it's just a perfectly normal street again. I think it'd be fascinating to see that difference. Number seven, shoot duplicates. So when you're shooting a candid photo or an event, you might be rushing to get certain photos. Now as a result, your subject might be blinking in some of these, you might have the shot out of focus, they might have an unflattering face, which often happens, or maybe you have obnoxious friends that like mooning the camera in the background, who knows? To avoid any of these potentially shot rooting occurrences, it's a really great idea to shoot a bunch of duplicates of any of your important subjects, especially when they're moving subjects who aren't quite as stationary as buildings. Love to shoot buildings, so consistent. It's also a really good idea to shoot a variety of different angles to give yourself some options. So try shooting some really tight close up shots of your subject, try some wide further away shots, try some vertical and try some horizontal photos, but it's always good to have a little bit of both for all these things. And final tip number eight, fail and curate. So when you're shooting these events or trips, whatever, you're shooting anything and everything, so many different options, all this variety, and so many of your shots are gonna be absolutely horrible. And that's perfectly okay, because your family, friends, clients, Whoever you're shooting for never actually has to see all of your lazy composition, missed focus, and just plain old boring shots. They only have to see your beautifully edited, curated photos of the best ones that you get. Moving back now to step one, you're gonna have some photos in these batches that aren't incredibly perfect and they might not stand up alone, yet once they're put into the part of the larger story, they're actually so important because all of your artsy, beautiful photos now have further context and they all become stronger images as a result. To put this failure element into perspective for you guys, when I go out shooting and shoot hundreds of photos in one day, I'd expect about two to 5% of the photos I'm actually gonna love maybe 10% they're gonna be good, another 25% they're gonna be fine, and then 60% of my shots are gonna be eye-bleedingly horrible garbage. And that's totally normal because no one has to see it. No one has to know how many bad photos you're getting. They're only gonna see the good ones. Before our challenge, a huge thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. They make it incredibly easy to build a sleek, beautiful website. I've been using my Squarespace site for years where I flex my photo portfolio, sell prints in my online store, and show off my tutorials and camera advice. So whether you're a professional photographer or want to trick people into thinking you are, Squarespace is the move. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash joshcats to save 10% on your purchase of a website or domain. My challenge for you today is simple yet very important. So what it is, is I want you to think about whatever you enjoy shooting most of this entire world, and then figure out how to turn it into a story. When I first started taking photos, my biggest passion in the field was photographing skateboarding. And that example I gave earlier of the lead up and the after process of getting a skateboarding trick were some of the first photo stories that I ever told. Now, this was actually my introduction to shooting portraiture, to shooting documentary photography. I fell in love with so many more realms because of this, and the same thing will definitely happen to you as you learn how to shoot everything in an event and not just the main favorite subject of yours. So for example, if you love taking macro photos of plants, try expanding that process. So try going to your Home Depot or local garden center and shooting photos of the process for buying a new plant, the process of your friend or you gardening and putting it in there to your backyard, and then maybe the process of it growing over time. Or maybe your story is gonna be about time and you wanna photograph this same plant in four different seasons. There's so much different potential here, but I do just recommend coming up with a photo story you can go out and shoot immediately and quickly over the course of a day or two and not over the course of an entire year. 
So for example, I did this with my national park photos and I made this story just about the process of time throughout one day. So it starts off with sunrise, watching the sun come up over the mountains, and then we're skating through the park. We got the midday group portrait, golden hour, sunset, and then a little bit of astrophotography in the dark. A full day with the main narrative being time. Additionally, there is no right length for a photo story. It could be four to six photos, it could be 25. I do just recommend starting small so you can really accomplish this quickly but do whatever you're feeling inspired by and get creative. My one final request is once you create this photo story, I want you to put it up on Instagram in a carousel post using the hashtag JoshCatsPhotos and tagging me at JoshCats so I can see the amazing work that you guys are coming up with. Definitely do this because I'll be sharing my favorite photo stories you guys post in my next photo tutorial. My last one, by the way, was Cinemagraphs. So you can check that out right here. And a couple final tips on things you can do with a photo story. You could put them on your website in a blog post, or you could even make a photo book to commemorate your trip or adventure, loosely inspired by your grandma's scrapbooking. You can check out my last tutorial on making cinemagraphs right here. So beautiful and fun to make. And be sure to subscribe for more future videos. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you eventually.